Good evening and welcome to our Women Equality Day celebration. Thank you so much for being part of today. I'm very excited. Thank you very much to all of our friends who shared the invite and help us spread the word. I think that we can continue to do these types of events and have an intimate conversation about what it takes uh, for women to lead and how we can create more leaders among us and encourage ourselves to continue to lead in this great city. So 96 years ago, uh, women were granted the right to vote on August 18th of 1920. 96 years ago. And the reason that's so important is because you know, 50 years later, in 1970, um, you know, a group of women um, from now organized one of the largest uh, women movements uh, of the 1960s. And out of that came the, uh, you know, calling for equal uh, opportunities in the workplace. And it called for child care for women who went back to work. And it called for uh, equal rights in this country for women. So even though we were granted the right to vote in 1920, women were still um, not being treated equally in the workplace. And so when I talk about women and equal rights and all of our friends who are, are here on the panel, we talk and we look back and we say, wow, a lot of things have changed. Um, and unfortunately, some things have stayed the same. And so when we talk about leading and all the different women that have paved the way for so many of us, especially those of us who are serving in office, but even the ones who are leading in the corporate world and are leading in their nonprofits or in their own communities, is like, what is it about the women's movement? What have we learned from that? And what can we continue to um, teach ourselves and continue to grow? And what kinds of changes do we continue, do we need to push in our society? You know, yesterday I had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, Barbara Boxer's uh, women's luncheon, and unfortunately it's gonna be her last women luncheon. And I had an opportunity to hear from Anita, Anita Hill. How many have ever heard of Anita Hill? Okay. We should all know who Anita Hill is. And one of the things that resonated from yesterday's luncheon is that we have so much more work to do in terms of teaching younger women what these amazing trailblazers and what these amazing women in history have done for our movement. We don't do that, we don't do that enough. And so when we look at women who don't necessarily support other women, or we have this constant conversation about why aren't more women on board with us when we run for office, and we have to have that conversation because it's very real, especially for those of us who have ran for office. I ask myself, it's because I don't think we've done a good enough job, job of teaching women's history to the younger generation, um, and we need to do that. We need to ensure that our women, as they're growing up, understand who the Anita Hills of our lifetime are. Anita Hill, back in 1991, I was graduating high school. I don't know how many of you guys remember what you were doing in 1991. She went before um, uh, the confirmation uh, hearing of, of, of um, Clarence Thomas. And she was put through the ringer. Women called her a liar. People vilified her. People questioned her character. Um, she talked about yesterday about retaliation and what that meant for her when she was teaching at the University of Oklahoma Law School and what that did to her career. And these are things that people don't talk about because people have either forgotten or we haven't done a good enough history of teaching what this woman went through in order to expose what this man had done to her. And 25 years later, she's still teaching, she's still a professor, but it goes to show me that we just still have so much more work to do. And I want to make a call, I don't know if she'll do this, but I want to invite Anita Hill to this council chambers for Black History Month in February. And we need to bring her here, and we need to have conversations like that, and bring the young women into council chambers so they can listen to the Anita Hills. Not only read about her, but actually talk to her and hear what she has to teach us. We need to do that. I'm gonna reach out to her and see if she'll come. She doesn't do a lot of public um, appearances, but I wanna make an effort to try to get her down to Los Angeles and, and, and honor her and pay tribute to what she's done for our, our, our history in, in, this, in this country. The other thing that, um, that comes to mind is as we're having this conversation about supporting one another, and I talk about this a lot, it's like what does it take for us to take the plunge to wanna run for office? After the, the aftermath of Anita Hill is that almost 20 Congress women were elected after 1991. That's huge. 
At the same time, we see our numbers dwindling. We see less women. We see our numbers dwindling in the state legislature. We're losing a number of women in office. Our number of women is dwindling, and it has a lot to do with the fact that it, it's taking more of an effort to try to get them elected for a variety of reasons, and some of our panelists are going to get into that. But as we talk about the importance of us serving in public office and what it does to issues that are important to women, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we are, we are dealt different cards. We are, there is a double standard that some people are very uncomfortable talking about. For example, when I run for office, people comment on the color of my lipstick. People comment on the size of my hair. People comment on the color of my dress. And Wendy can attest to this when she was running for mayor. They wrote an article on, her, on your hairstyle. You were growing your, your hair out because you had a, a shorter hairdo. And we have these conversations about, well, if the woman's running for office, who's raising your children at home? How many of the men that are running for office nowadays are asked that question? So there's a double standard in our society that, we've gotta be, that we have to confront and that we have to talk about and we have to expose. And there's nothing wrong with, with being proud of being a woman. There's certainly nothing wrong with taking credit for the work that we do because what we do means something, especially for those of us who've been doing it for a really, really long time. So I want to have a conversation about how we support one another, how we continue to mentor one another, how we can stop this, this notion that uh, we have to live a perfect life because we have kids, we're married, have partners, and we have to run for office, hold a corporate job, or work full time. Sometimes our lives are a little chaotic, and that's okay. My life is chaotic, and we have to accept that. But we have a role to play in society, and we need to be very comfortable with taking power, owning power, and being very confident about having power. And that's why these, these fabulous women are here with me. I've had a working relationship with every single one of them. They're my friends. They're people that I count on when I'm stuck and I don't have the answers to a certain issue or I'm stuck because I want to see more women get elected and we have conversations about how we do that together. Every single one of them has played a role in my life, has played a role in my career, and they have a lot of, of awesome experiences to share with you. And how do we support them as well? How do we have that conversation about supporting one another? Uh, our moderator is a dear friend of mine who actually I, I met on the campaign trail and actually Courtney I met through Wendy. Um, and Wendy and I have been friends for a really, really long time. And Courtney Lebeau, uh, Lebeau I always want to call you Lebeau. It's just so much, it's so cute. I just love your last name. Uh, Courtney is a phenomenal woman. Um, uh, recently, we were on the, Hillary, on the Hillary campaign trail together. And she can talk a little bit about her experience. But she's currently a consultant, a speaker, a lecturer, and a published author on various topics, an expert on ISIS. She's an expert on, on countering violent extremism and counterterrorism, and currently she's advising um, the Los Angeles Police Department on counterterrorism unit on strategic, strategic initiatives to tackle extremism. I have never met a woman <laughs> who is uh, taking on these very important issues. When you talk about terrorism and what's happening around um, the world, Courtney is one of the experts on how to tackle uh, counterterrorism, and she's consulting LAPD on some of these very issues. She's also on the board of Emerge, and for those of you who don't know Emerge, you will get to know Emerge um, today because we have Lindsay, who is um, with Emerge California, and I met Emerge California through another really good friend of mine, Kimberly, and she introduced me to this awesome organization that's not only recruiting women, Democratic women, but they're, they're bringing them together from across the state. They're training them and giving them the tools to run for office. And Courtney sits on the board of Emerge. And she's also um, has worked her heart out to make sure that we elect the first female president of the United States. So Courtney has a lot of experience, um, not only on, in her professional life, but also as a volunteer and a huge advocate for women and someone that I call a dear friend. And as we, uh, as I talked about Anita Hill and all the women who came before I did and, and paved the way, and Anita Hill as a result of that, the aftermath was 20 women got elected to Congress. I hope that electing the first woman in November as president of this great country would propel more women to get elected um, in public office and that more women would take that plunge and want to serve 
Um, it's an incredible opportunity, but it, it's also very, very, very difficult. Um, but we need to continue to support one another. And I'm just very, very lucky to count um, on so many of you as friends and supporters and, and mentors of mine. And hopefully this, these events will help you connect with one another. And when we make a call to action for us to step up and um, not be ashamed or afraid of stepping up and, and uh, being there for other women, that we can do that together. So with no further ado, I want to just introduce again my friend Courtney. Thank you so much for doing this um, and for being such an amazing leader. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that glowing, kind introduction. I uh, feel the exact same way about you, and it's been a joy to, to work with you and learn from you, um, as well as all these amazing women. So are you guys ready? All right, cool. So thank you guys for, for joining us. Uh, I'm really honored uh, to be here and to talk about this day. Well, really, it's Friday, but this week we can sort of call it as Women's Equality Week uh, and what that means. And, and in this election year, uh, it's so important now more than ever to talk about uh, women's rights, reproductive rights, equal pay, all of that stuff um, as rights and values that, that we have to fight for. Um, this day is not just about celebrating voting rights, but it's also about shining a spotlight on that continued mission uh, towards equality, which I know all of us have worked so tirelessly uh, on doing. So with that, let's uh, take a minute and sort of introduce all of our panelists and uh, their own unique and individual ways and how they contribute uh, to that fight. So thank you guys again for being here. So let's start on this end uh, with Ms. Lindsay Bubar, who I work with very closely uh, at Emerge. Lindsay's a political consultant, uh, best known for her recruiting, training, and advising women on uh, progressive candidates as they run for office. Uh, she works to ensure that we have full gender equality in politics. Uh, Lindsay serves as the president and vice president uh, of political action for the National Women's Political Caucus, uh, the LA West Side side, and is on the advisory board of Running Start. Uh, Lindsay currently lives in Los Angeles with her husband, David Graham Casso, and their really, really cute little one, uh, Caleb, who I love seeing pictures of on Facebook. Um, Let's see, Monica Rodriguez next to her. Um, all of our names are here too, so you can see who's speaking. Uh, Monica is president of Latinas Lead California and most recently served as vice president on the Board of Public Works, uh, appointed by Mayor Garcetti, bringing more than 20 years of public and private sector experience, which commenced at City Hall at the age of 20. She's only like 24, so, you know. <laughs> as staff to Councilmember Hernandez Alcron and uh, Mayor Richard Reardon. Uh, a candidate for Los Angeles City Council in 2007, she realized uh, those added hurdles presented uh, to Latina candidates and has since committed herself to closing that gap. A graduate of Occidental College, Rodriguez is a lifelong resident of the Northeast San Fernando Valley with her husband and two children. And Monica is currently a candidate for Los Angeles City Council in the 7th District. So need all of your help on that one as well. Uh, Ms. Wendy Gruel, next to me. Uh, we also are on the board together of Emerge California. Uh, in 2009, Wendy was elected city controller, becoming only the second woman in LA's history elected to citywide office. If you can, I mean, sometimes these statistics just make me cringe. Um, throughout her year, Wendy's gained, uh, her career, Wendy's gained a reputation as a consensus builder, a passionate advocate, and a tough fiscal watchdog. Wendy and her husband, Dean, are the proud parents of Thomas, who will one day, I'm sure, run for office, and <laughs> spent so much time with him at the DNC, and he's the cutest, smartest, sweetest little boy uh, who attends public school here in LA. So next to me, Carrie Ann Farrell Hines. Hines, there you go, Hines. Carrie Ann is the Director of Operations for the National Women's Political Caucus in Los Angeles, uh, the West Side Chapter Board of Directors. Uh, she's dedicated her professional life to serving and advocating for others. So you can kind of see a common theme amongst all of our, our panelists here. Hines is an appointee to the Los Angeles County Commission for Women. In addition, Hines collaborates with multiple organizations committed to advocating for equal representation of women and people of color in elected and appointed office. 
And last but definitely not least, uh, Dr. Jackie Fila. Jackie's an assistant professor of political science at Mount St. Mary's University and braved a whole lot of traffic coming from the west side over here, as I'm sure many of you guys have. Uh, Dr. Fila directs Mount St. Mary's annual Ready to Run Women's Campaign Training Program, as I'm sure many of you guys have heard, uh, which connects women interested in running for political public office with campaign experts and elected officials around the city. As a professor at a women's college, she's passionate about teaching students the writing and quantitative analysis skills necessary for them to become public policy professionals. So thank you guys all for being here. You, you are an array of amazing women um, that I learned from and I'm proud to be amongst. So um, I think sort of the program here, we'll, we'll kick it off with some questions and, and uh, have a robust discussion. And if there's some time, I wanna kick it off to you guys as I'm sure many of you might have some questions uh, for our amazing panelists. And then we'll kick it back to the council member to uh, open up the discussion for the, uh, well, the film. So, what type of barriers, you know, we, we heard from the council member on uh, the, some of the barriers that women face in terms of running for office. So what type of barriers do you think, I'm gonna kick it to you, Lindsay, um, as Southern California Director of Emerge. We do this all the time, right? So what are some of the barriers that women face when deciding to run for office and also pulling the trigger and actually running? Testing, okay. Um, I think there are so many, and frankly, this entire panel discussion could be just about that question. Um, so I will keep it short, but um, many of those barriers Nuri talked about in um, her introduction, just the, the double standard that women face when they run for office. So, you know, men don't have to deal with um, being scrutinized over their appearance. Um, being challenged about their parenting or partnering skill, uh, you know, commitments. Um, frankly, women still bear the burden of, um, you know, childcare, senior care, and other home duties. So that piece is challenging. The balancing question, like at Emerge, one of the things we talk about is balancing uh, work life and running for office. And I'm not sure that men really consider that when they run. Um, and just, I think, we still don't have the mentorship that men have, so women, for first of all, aren't seeing them, seeing other women in public office as much as men are, and we don't have the mentorship that the men have, so you don't see as much, you know, women rising through the ranks of someone's office and then being groomed to run for office. And what that leads to is women, when they run, not being connected to the political power structure that they really need to be in order to be successful when they win. Um, so, you know, we see things like independent expenditures, for example, coming in really strong for men because they have the connections to that power structure and women really don't have that. Um, so it's one of the things that I love about Emerge is that it's building this network of women. Um, Emerge calls it the Emerge Sisterhood, but it's like really um, trying to build out the connections to the political power structure because I think that's a huge piece that's a barrier for women as they're considering and when they're running. Well, you know, you, you mentioned some of those uh, barriers and, you know, the council member mentioned some of those as well. Wendy and Monica, I'm curious, uh, you know, Wendy, I know you, you run for, you have run for office uh, and Monica, you're running right now. What are some of the challenges that you faced? Um, you know, Nuri mentioned the article and then Monica, what are, what are you sort of facing now as a woman? Well, I think there's common themes and I, I do want to acknowledge Nuri Martinez and um, the position that she's in and being the only woman on the city council. Um, and um, not for long. I mentioned that I spoke to a group of women this morning at Universal, um, NBC Universal. Uh, they had a kind of a women's dialogue type of thing as well. And, and I heard an audible gasp when I said there was only one woman on the city council, because I think most people don't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I know Monica and I, because we have known each other through many of the elections, um, and when I first ran, of course, I was told it wasn't my turn. Mm -hmm. I was told I wouldn't be a good fundraiser. Mm -hmm. I uh, was told that uh, I, well, my mother told me I'd never get married and have children if I ran for office, but thank God she was wrong on that, as, as others. But um, And you met your husband. And I met my husband when I was running for there office, so there you go on that. That might be an incentive for some of you yes. ladies. 
And, and also, you know, questioned whether or not I could be uh, a good mother and an elected official. And so um, I think that the, the challenge that we face is you have to have in your, your gut, and I mentioned this this morning at Remarks, which was you have to be able to be comfortable in who you are and what you're doing. And every time that someone says something that is bad about you or, you know, and, and you were just like, that's not me, how do I defend myself? You have to remember why. And they, and they asked me this question this morning. What did you do when someone was attacking you? What did you do when that poll came out and said you, you know, were behind that day? And I said, I remembered the guy um, who came to me and wanted me to help get their soccer field in Van Nuys area in North Hollywood that no one had done for them. Or the little girl who said to me, thank you so much for that stop sign, you know, that you were able to do. Whatever it was, it reminded me that all these other people didn't matter. Um, that what I was doing was trying to uh, be uh, the best, whether city council member, controller, or, or mayor at the time. But I think we see, um, even in the national race, um, there's still conversations about women's hair and women's dress and whether or not women will be more unduly influenced by people. Um, and they don't have those conversations about men. And so I think it is incumbent upon us to also make that statement which says, if you see it, I can't. There's, there's actually an organization that says if you, if they, if you see it, say something about it. But remind, call people out on it, um, and tell them that's not accurate. And being able to ensure that other women are also helping women. Um, we had a young woman this morning who came up to us on confidentially, um, who said her boss was there, who's not very supportive of her at all, and she doesn't know what to do, and she's in this tough spot. And we use that. Old, you know, old, old phrase of Madeleine Albright, which is there's a special place in hell for women who don't help women. Um, it doesn't mean you always are supporting the women. I want to make that clear. But you're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And you're going to be in a place where you do that. And so you have to remind people that it's not OK to have that kind of discriminatory behavior and the questions that you ask women candidates or elected officials that you don't ask of the male candidates. Sorry, longer. Answer. No, it's, it's Monica. It's great. Um, like you, I mean, 2007 when I ran, I was told, "Did you ask permission? Uh, your kids are going to hate you. Uh, <clears throat> how are you going to balance being a mother and doing and you know your professional work?" I will tell you, for for women candidates, and even now uh, as I endeavor to do this again, um, you know, one of the primary factors that we're concerned with is women and those of us that. We had to have a professional career that is far and above more spectacular than many of our male counterparts. Uh, and with that comes a tremendous amount of responsibility for us to provide for our family and continue to do so even as we endeavor to run for office. Um, those are very significant considerations that women have to make that oftentimes men don't have to. Um, you know, we use the word mentorship, but I think honestly men are sponsored. Uh, it's, it's not about mentorship, it's sponsorship. There's no, uh, there are shortcuts for them that are not afforded to us as women. Mm -hmm. um, there are candidates that just get placed into districts that they have no history in, and it's perfectly acceptable. Uh, but as women, the uh, characterizations that we are, you know, we receive, we would never be afforded those same opportunities. So there are just some very distinct differences of what we experience as, as women candidates. Um, clearly, I mean, the list goes on mm -hmm. in terms of some of the things that we are told. Uh, but as I endeavor to do this again, I, I've affirmed with my children, they don't hate me. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very mm -hmm. much supportive of this, uh, of this effort. And, you know, I, again, I, you know, for me personally, it's, uh, and I think a lot of it is derived from, you know, I had a, I had a very, uh, you know, they, they say a lot of fathers um, become feminists because of their daughters. And I am fortunate uh, to have had an example in my father who was very much an in, a, a big part, a big influence in my life who said there were no limits to what I could do and allowed me to be exactly who I needed to be. And it was that experience that afforded me the strength to endure some of the biggest challenges that I've ever uh, had to endure professionally running for office the first time around, and it's just given me even thicker skin getting ready for the second time. And you're, <laughs> yep, round two. Um, so Carrie Ann, when you, when you think about gender parity, why, in your experience, why do you think that that's so important in terms of leadership and for our local governments, our state governments, and our national governments? 
Well, I think it's important for us to have a diversity of, uh, of people at the table, you know, when we're discussing the issues that matter to us most. Um, you know, Councilwoman Martinez has given many examples mm -hmm. in, you know, the times that she's been, you know, talking about this issue about the ways in which she has had to educate her uh, colleagues about issues and to get them to think about it in a different way. And it's not always a malicious thing. It's not that you know men don't care about women and don't care about women's issues. It's just they don't have the experiences. And so it's really important to have you know, people from different backgrounds, people of different genders, people of different ethnicities all at the table talking about these very important issues because otherwise you really will have a, you know, a you know, single faceted perspective on how to come to us come to these really important right. solutions. Well, and and you you sort of touch on on that and I want to probe a little bit further with with you Jackie and in terms of research, I mean, I know you do research and you're at the university. Is there research, and I'm sure you can sort of comment on that and give some bullet points as to what research says about that gender parity? Yeah, so gender parity is important for all of the reasons that Carrie Ann had said. Um, we noticed important gender differences in not just our experiences, but how we approach problem solving, how we approach working with people or not working with people and um, also the issue experience. Um, so there is just this idea that women do experience life um, in some ways just very differently than men. And so one of the things that we find um, to sort of highlight why it's really important to have women at the table is that even though we hear that women are mean girls and they don't like to work together, the research actually shows that that's not true. Um, particularly in decision-making settings, women are more collaborative. And if you look at a lot of the research coming out of Congress, we see that women are much more likely to um, say that they have really large networks, that they're really engaged in their networks. Um, their network, network centricity scores are higher, meaning that they're more willing to work with people across the aisle, work with people in their networks. And um, this has some real important ramifications. So if you remember when the government shut down, it was the women who came together in the Senate mm -hmm. and said, we have to cut a deal. And even though the men took all the credit, um, it really was women getting together because quite frankly, in the Senate, the only caucus that still meets across party lines is the Women's Caucus. Um, but we can look to um, Europe to actually see where these differences matter because you do have required gender parity by law. And um, what we do see is that policies um, that are passed with these types of laws where you have equal men and women, um, they report that the, um, the citizens report that they're more equally represented. And so if you look at just corporations, which is also something that's required in um, Europe, we do see that um, having gender balance and having more women in your leadership actually leads to more work-friendly policies, which we know is a really big women's issue um, in the area of gender pay and equity, mm -hmm. but also in maternity leave and child care. Um, and then you also retain really good women in the workforce um, when you have those types of policies. Um, but we also see that fiscal management is actually better under women. Um, in corporations where they're required to have um, board um, gender balanced boards and in not-for-profits that are required to have gender balanced boards, you actually see um, far fewer financial scandals and actually far fewer people mm. going to jail. Um, so I don't know if it's that women That's are less likely thing. to commit crimes or we're just better at it, um, <laughs> but um, the evidence yeah. is there that there is a discernible difference um, in not just the inputs but also the outputs um, of what happens when you have more women at the table. Yeah. No, that's that's great uh, from a research perspective. Uh, why do you why do you think that Europe and these other countries overseas have these quotas, and we don't? Sure. Um, so, and it, it's not just Europe. So we think well, in a lot of ways, maybe Europe is more progressive than the United States. But you see, in a lot of the new constitutions that are being reconstituted in the Middle East, um, they mm -hmm. have gender quotas built into them. Um, Latin America has had gender quotas for a very very long time. Um, in fact, those are the people I would say you should look to if you're really interested in how these movements get started. But in the United States, there, this, there is this sort of view that um, requiring any sort of special person is anti-democratic mm -hmm. and is some form of reverse discrimination. And um, so the idea that we could say that certain positions have to be set aside for groups is by and large just in a matter of public opinion very unpopular in the United States. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you think about it, it wasn't until the 1970s that um, public opinion, popular public opinion, actually had a majority of Americans actually favoring the idea 
that a woman could be president of the United States. Right. Not that they'd vote for her, or not that she should be, but just that she could. And that's the 1970s. That's not all that long ago. Right. Well, you mentioned a woman running, so let's sort of shift it um, and talk a little bit about Hillary Clinton, as many of us have worked tirelessly on uh, this campaign in various capacities. So, you know, this is the first time a woman has been nominated for uh, the presidency. Yeah, we can give a, get a shout out for that. A lot of familiar faces uh, in the audience, uh, too, working really, really hard uh, to get her in there. So, you know, so this is a major political sort of step, but yet we can continue to see the number of women uh, being elected at the state and local level declining, right? So I want to open it up to all of you guys, and what do you think has caused that decrease, uh, first of all, and then what can we do about it? When do you want to start? Sure. I mean, I think there's a, a couple, couple reasons. I mean, one uh, is uh, the fact that um, it is difficult to run for office in the, in the middle of a career or in the middle of uh, having your child. And so many of the, I would say, prior to the, the newest iteration of uh, women who've been on the city council, uh, before it was usually those who kids had grown up and they right. had, you know, now they were um, empty nesters or their husband died and they took their place. I mean, that was really how you mm -hmm. got into mm -hmm. elective office. Uh, I think as well, there are women who say, I could never go through what you went through. Um, and they see, whether it be Hillary Clinton or they see other uh, elected officials, and they, and they don't feel like they can ever do that. Um, and to those people, I say, it's okay, really. I mean, you're doing it a second time, you know. I've, I've won and I've lost, and I've seen both of those things happen. So I think that um, it's also, um, there is much more scrutiny um, now than there ever has been. Um, with the kind of social media and other things uh, that uh, people kind of go, I, I, again, I'm not sure I want to be able to do that. The difficulty of raising money, um, so many young women or others say, I don't know how to do it, I'm really bad at it, uh, and I'm afraid to do that. And we, part of what Emerge does and others is really an NWPC is not only support women in that effort, but also teach them how to do it. Um, and it is a skill. It is not an easy thing. Um, I always talk about the difference between how the men and the women do it, um, and some of my past staffers who are here can, you know, relate to this. Um, but you know, a guy calls someone on raising money, sitting next to me to do an initiative, and calls Joe and says, "Joe, I need five thousand dollars for this initiative. Um, the initiative is called X, and on, I need it by Friday. Hope the family's well." I call. I ask first thing. I say, "Joe, how's your family?" Is everything going well? How's your business? Well, I have this initiative, and let me explain it to you. So I go through the whole thing because I think, you know, he's going to do it because he wants to because it's a good cause. And then I ask for 5000 maybe by Friday, if not Monday's okay, you know. Well, who's more successful? The guy. However, I have learned, you know, after raising to, you know, close to $10 million, um, it, it, you, you learn how to do it better, and um, thankfully to people who helped teach me that. But I think those are all barriers that women, women look at, and it goes back to the, the point of um, it's not just recruiting, it's an anointing. I think you may have even used another word in that, but sponsorship. sponsorship. Uh, a very big difference, and it is incumbent, again, on us, and, and I have not always been perfect. Um, in making sure that I had the, the, the right people and the women in, in place to do that. And it, it means talking to them now, uh, whatever age they may be, and saying you're going to be supportive. Uh, that's a very important message. I remember that story so much when, when Wendy talked about that uh, at Emerge in one of our trainings, and it really stuck with me because I think women are just wired differently. You know, we think differently. Um, but in terms of fundraising, that's such a key component. Um, and I do want to say, I see some men in the audience, and this is so important. This is not, you know, just for women, right? We're part of, of society, but it's, it's, a, it's a human sort of issue to be inclusive. So I want to give it a shout out to, to the men that I see in the audience, because it's important for all of us to be on top of these uh, issues. So salute to you guys. Um, speaking of the men, um, what do you think, Lindsay, in terms of, it, are we sort of in a boys club with respect to running for office? Uh, well, yeah, we definitely, absolutely. Um, and to, to the point that we've yeah. all made, um, you know, there is, the, and Wendy, you said anointed, and I think sponsorship and anoint, anointing other men is both perfect ways to say it. I mean, it's like, it's very hard for women to break in, and, um, you know, you said, 
men have to be involved and we need men who are anointing women, right? Like we, uh, we hear a lot of conversations about women helping women, which of course that's a key component to us moving this conversation and agenda forward. But if men aren't anointing women, then we're never gonna grow our numbers. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, we do have a few good men on the city council and locally and statewide and who support women's organizations and who are here tonight. Sorry about that. Um, but we need more um, because we, we just, we can't do it we can't do it on our own, but it's certainly um, certainly a boys club, certainly why as women, we need to be strong um, together. We need to work together together better. I think we've made a lot of progress. I think there's a lot more to do. Um, and to your point before that goes into this question, I think um, one of the problems that we face is that we, we have a pipeline building problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have a lot of people, men and women, who are focused on national politics. Uh, right now, electing Hillary, but even past that, you know, the Senate and Congress and, and others, and um, not focused on where all those women came from, right? Almost all of them ran for local office, and so we're in a place now when there's a seat that opens up in the assembly and someone needs to jump in because it's a special election. You have a dude in office who's anointed another dude that's ready to run rather than the pipeline being full of women who are ready to run and jump in when that opportunity arises. And so I think that's one thing that we need to really pay attention to. Yeah, and, and building that bench, you know, so that there are women that feel confident when that time arises that they can jump in for that too because it's certainly not just about, you know, the presidential election but uh, building that pipeline or that bench that, that you know, we're at all levels of, of government. Um, do any of you guys want to touch on that? Yeah, I think that there's also a really important psychological component um, that we have to talk about. And so um, on average, when you think you want to achieve gender parity, it's impossible to do when you look at ballots and only 20% of the candidates are women. Um, and so even if you won every single race, then you'd only still be 20%. Um, and so what the research shows is that on average of those um, that have decided that they were going to run for something. Um, when you ask men, how many times did someone have to ask you or tell you that you'd be good in office for you to run? And the, the two most common responses are, I just knew that, right? Like when Bill Clinton met the president when he was in high school and he was measuring the drapes instead of shaking hands, um, or only one time. But for women on average, and these are women who have run for office, the average is six. Um, we ask women six times on average before they run. And um, so one of the things that we see um, is a couple of things, is that women don't think that we're as good at things that we are. So when it goes back to fundraising, um, women are actually fantastic fundraisers um, and raise tons and tons of money for their organizations and their causes. If you need a park built, you ask women. Um, you want to start a charity, you ask women. Um, but then when it comes to those same women asking people for money for themselves, they're way less hesitant to do so. Um, and the same is true for con making contributions. Um, on average, only 38% of political contributions are women. Um, and so it's not just I support you, Wendy, because you're running, but I support you with a check. Um, mm -hmm. Writing checks also gives you access to people who are running to office, and that's really important. And then I would say finally, um, it is that notion of pipelining that is really quite important because we enacted laws that we thought would be really good for women. So we thought that term limits would be really, really great for women um, because then you know the seat would open up and women would get those seats. Um, but if you're not in a position to move into that, um, then it is much harder to break um, ground on that. And so one of the other things that women do not do, that men definitely do, is when people come to you thinking that you could be in this pipeline, um, they'll ask women, who's in your network? And women will say, oh, nobody. You know, I, I, I maybe know this person, and they vote. And um, we actually know tons of people. Um, and everybody that you know right now, everybody in this room is your political network. We are a political network. And so you have to start viewing all of the things that you do, all of the people you meet, all of the organizations that you're a part of as not just your friends and your family and your social network or your work network, they're all your political network. And until we're willing to own that and feel comfortable um, making that leap, we're gonna have a harder time being pipelined um, than men who say, oh yeah, I know everybody. And everybody's my political network and I'm going to have all these resources. We could do that too. Um, I think also we have a, a public perception problem about public service. Uh, mm -hmm. And you know we're seeing in the media and online how uh, there's a lack of respect for public service, and that can be mm -hmm. uh, you know a dissuasion for women to put themselves out there 
Because if people don't respect you for stepping up and saying, I want to serve on city council, I want to serve on my school board, I want to be governor, I want to be president, if women look at the way that other women are being treated when they're running for office, why would someone want to subject themselves to that? You know, so one of the things that you know, groups that I'm working with try to do is we try to talk to one another about you know, what, how you survive this and why it's important and why it's good and why you can asking the six times, you know, right. you, yeah, we're you should you. run. Everybody yes. here, this is two asks from us. <laughs> Me, <No>. three. <laughs> why, why, you know, why you, why should you put yourself out there? Because serving is good. It is important. It is valued. And we need to be having those conversations too. We need to be reminding people it's a good thing to be ambitious. It's a good thing to want to do good. It's a good thing to want to serve because if not you, then someone else will. And it's not always someone who is the best because you are the best. And I think there's been a study that shows women really want um, to be able to accomplish something. I mean, that when they take a job or they take a position, they want to see um, success. Mm -hmm. and, and they sometimes look at going to public office like, Ugh, they, you know, we're never going to get anything done. And so that seems to be a barrier too. And I, you know, I want to say, in terms of creating that pipeline, I know Mayor Garcetti has done an outstanding yes. job with his appointments of uh, women commissioners, 54%, I think was the last tally. Uh, that's a very meaningful way to help expose more women to even the process of government and uh, getting women more you know, prepared for taking that leap. Uh, but more importantly, I, I look at the work that we're doing with Latinas Lead, outside of just preparing women to be comfortable uh, in those leadership roles, it's about making sure that we've identified the next generation that is not just going to carry on those leadership roles in assuming public office, but the leadership roles of building our network. Uh, I cannot do this forever. Uh, and you know, so many of us have you know, really grown our networks of uh, our professional networks that have been very beneficial to helping elect many men mm -hmm. uh, and some women. We need, we're trying to do more. Uh, but I have to impart that to somebody. And I have to help create another pipeline of women that are prepared to help support other women in a meaningful way so that we can get them elected. And that's part of the work that we're doing also with Latinas Lead because we have a young professional network of some really dynamic young women that are really gonna be the next generation of women that help to elect those that are in the pipeline. And so, you know, we have this uh, parallel track of both women that we need to prepare to run for office that want to take on those roles, but more importantly, we have to create that parallel track of women that are helping to build those networks that are gonna be supportive of one another. And I think that's an important part of the... Absolutely, yeah. You know, turning it back to Secretary Clinton, and I'm gonna turn it to you, Jackie, because I know I have to leave in a few minutes, so I wanna, I wanna kick it to you in terms of the, the national conversation, um, do you see any difference uh, now that there is a woman in the race in terms of the, the, the policy or just the nation, national conversation in general around the elections, uh, not just because she's a woman, but in terms of actual policy that's different because she is a woman? Do you see that the, that the conversation has changed at all now that there's a woman in the race? Um, so I, I think in two interesting ways. I think um, we really have a Congress that's kind of a stalemate Congress, so they're not doing much, unfortunately, either way. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that we're sort of focused on, like, Hillary won the nomination, and so women are doing really, really well this year. Um, and the truth of the matter is, in California, we're not. Mm -hmm. um, we know we're going to lose three females in the state legislature. How do we know that? Three females are leaving. No women um, are on the ballot in November to replace them. Um, Nuri is still our only woman um, in LA City Council. And um, to her credit, um, at Mount St. Mary's, we do tons of women's programming, and she comes every time we ask and um, always points out how pathetic it is that there's just the one, um, but we still have that. Um, we still, in these larger races, um, or, or excuse me, in the smaller races, are losing women, um, and that doesn't seem to be part of anybody's conversation, um, and it's sort of this idea that we made it. What I think is really interesting, um, and I read, and I think this came out of Pew, is what they found um, in the millennials, particularly the Bernie supporters, um, who are sort of resident, reticent to get on the Hillary bandwagon, is that they sort of have this idea, well, if not Hillary, it will be another woman. It's only a matter of time, no big deal. 
but we said that about Geraldine Ferraro. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's 30 years later and that hasn't happened. So I think with all the jubilation and it's really exciting and I'm really um, an excited Hillary supporter, we do have to remember that number one, she hasn't won. We have to elect her. Um, but number two, there are tons of down ticket um, races that um, are really gonna have important, impactful things in women's lives and there aren't women in these ballots or there aren't women in the pipeline coming up in the next elections that are off here. And so we can't lose sight of the fact that it isn't just the presidency. And that's, I think, to me, been kind of the alarming thing about having um, all of this focus on Hillary, which is great. Well, and I want to add to that, and Councilwoman Martinez made a very good point about our responsibility to educate the next generation. Mm -hmm. And I think we've lost a significant opportunity in previous generations. What, you know, Hillary is by far the most qualified yes. candidate ever to run for president of the United States, but she had to be in order to be considered mm -hmm. a viable yeah. candidate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, it's a, it's a double standard of what the expectations are for women in terms of their preparedness versus men. And it's, it's a real standard, and it's something that I've found myself having to educate my own kids about, uh, having the conversations with them, because, you know, we, we take that for granted, um, and we have to make sure that, you know, just like, just as we prepare the next generation to run for office, just as we prepare the next generation to help elect others for, uh, prepare them to help elect others for office, we have to educate them just on the history of where we've come from so that we don't unwind the clock. And you're absolutely right. You know, 90, 92 is the year of the woman, right? We elected um, those 20 women to the Senate and everybody was like, yay! But people forget that the next federal election was termed the year of the angry white men because um, we actually saw a backslide. Um, so. It's, it's, it's important and it's good, but you also have to watch out for the fact that we are really short-sighted in our history. One victory isn't all the victories. You, you know, you actually touched on something that I want to talk about for a second as well, millennials. Um, there's been a lot of discussion around can Hillary garner that support of the millennials that, say, Bernie uh, gathered. So, I mean, do you think that gender disparity is less of an issue for this sort of next generation or those millennials? Um, yeah, the, the idea that you have the most qualified candidate running for president in history and that that is not exciting to people, that you hear the response, well, we want something different, we want something new, we want a change. And the, the change that they're recommending is a 70-year-old white man who has, you know, who has been, to his credit, you know, a champion for his issues for the last 40 years, the same, you know, same issues. And that was millennials, you know, to, to a number of millennials, that represented change. It was just that he was not Hillary. And Hillary had to have 40 plus years of, of experience to be, cons to be nominated, and then once she was nominated, she wasn't good enough anymore. You, you have to look at that critically. You really have to you know, get, ask people, and I've had several conversations with, with millennials, with men. You know, I've had men ask me, why, you know, why would I vote for her just because she's a woman? We're not voting for her just because she's a woman. We're voting for her because she's qualified and because she's experienced. You know, then when the response is, well, but, you know, she's got problems and she's, you know, she's been around for a long time and it's time for someone else. You know, why do we have to have that conversation? You know, why are we having to defend this, the importance of this choice? You know, that's why we have to gather like this and talk about, you know, this issue because it just is proof that there is not gender parity. There's not a gender equality is not important. It's just not, you know, it's not the most important thing in our minds right now. You go ahead and I'll go right after you. Two quick points to make. Um, I'm barely, yeah, barely young enough to be a millennial. So, and I'm a proud Hillary millennial supporter. Um, I guess I want to say that I think as women candidates, you have to be everything, right? So like the people that I've talked to that are Bernie supporters talk about being inspired by him and it's like an emotional thing, right? They're like emotionally invested in his candidacy. And he has the luxury of 
doing that because he also doesn't have to be perfect in every other way that women have to be perfect in order to be nominated as you know the democratic candidate for president so it's like we're expecting women to be all of these things the most qualified perfect hair this dress the this experience a this perfect family mom, life uh, yeah balance and it all so together. how can we expect her to be everything, including emotionally connecting with people and all of these various issues. It is impossible to do that. And so, you know, I think that's part of it. And then to Kirian's point about, you know, the pushback on, well, you're only voting for her because she's a woman. And it's like, I mean, yeah, I'm voting for her because she's a woman and all these other things, but that is something that's really important to me because that means something. I wouldn't be voting for her if she wasn't qualified and all of the other things that she is but like I and and some people might disagree with me but like I think we have to own that that is an issue to me people vote on a variety of issues I vote on gender because I think it's important to have that perspective at the table because I've been in a workplace where I've been sexually harassed mm -hmm. and I've had a late-term abortion and I've had all these experiences that if there weren't women at the table I wouldn't have been protected and had the access that I needed and all of these other things so like Yes, she's qualified and for all these other reasons, but I am voting for her because she's a woman. That matters to me. That, that, touche. I mean, that was, um, it makes me angry. It does. And I, I think that, you know, for millennials, and I am not close to being a millennial, I'll just tell you that, um, but uh, I'm way past millennial. However, um, I think that for millennials, and we've told this, and our parents told this to us, we could be anything we wanted to be. We are so... I'm focused on telling young women and others, you know, the sky's a limit. You can do whatever you want to do, and no one says, but guess what? <laughs> there's, the, there's that point. And so I have so many women who were millennials who then get to, I don't know the age where the cutoff is, but get to their position at 35, let's just say, and all of a sudden they didn't get that promotion, and they find out they are not getting paid the same as the other guy, and they're like, Wendy, you were right. And I said, I know. I didn't want you to have to experience that. So I think it's part of that not understanding that it is, um, it still exists out there. And it is incumbent upon us for our young children to kind of say you can do anything, but there are still barriers. I had the most interesting conversation with my son the other day because we were talking about the Equal Rights Amendment. And, and I said something like, well, it's not been passed. And he's like, what? There's no Equal Rights Amendment? And I thought, you know, wow, uh, if all of our kids could think in that way um, and explaining that there still needs to be that equality, um, we have some, some work to do. Uh, but I can see why some millennials are saying, I, I don't get it. I, of course, there could be a woman, and we shouldn't even think about it, because women have gotten here or there. But they don't know the history. And that's why the movie that you're going to show tonight is very important, because it, it does show the struggles. Well, and your son is a perfect uh, example. You know, I'm sure you guys probably watched a lot of the, the DNC. And do you guys remember that night when, I think it was Obama's night uh, that he spoke, and it was at the very end of the night, and the camera panned uh, to Hillary. She was in New York somewhere, and it was just her face. And do you remember she said, you know, if there's any little girls who are still up at night, and it zoomed back, and she was holding the hand of that little girl. I mean, I was in that room, and I remember crying. I was actually sitting next to Mayor Garcetti, and just the emotion in that room of, of that chance of, we're gonna change history. You know, I'm getting goosebumps even now thinking about it was such a, a powerful moment for little girls and little boys, you know, all around the, the world to, to not even think twice that this is a woman. We should be at the point where that doesn't even matter, you know? So with that, I, I actually, I see some hands already. Um, I wanna, we probably have maybe five minutes or so, right? Um, before we kick it off to the, to the movie. So let's maybe take one or two questions. Yes, go ahead. And I think we are, Arcelia will hand a, a microphone. <laughs> if you can ask your, your question, if you have it to a specific person or if not to the whole group, one of us can answer. Hi, Grace Barrios, Filipino Los Angeles Democrats, and I was a delegate. Yes, you were. First time, it was <laughs> historical. Um, I have a quick question because yes, we are, um, well, I come from the Philippines and we've had two women presidents and we now have a vice president who's also a woman. So uh, we've gone a long way. But I have a quick question in my observation of 22 years being involved in the community. I think we need to empower women who are the, the um, what do we call us? The baby boomers. 
Oh. <laughs> right? Because first is, I mean, yes, we have the millennials, but they have, first, politics is hard. I mean, even the men are having a hard time. Are there men around? <laughs> I mean, it's really hard with the term limits, all the things that you were seeing. It's a difficult, and I've always praised uh, politicians who continue to care for the community and what they're doing for all of us. So that's why it's hard for women because we juggle a lot of things, okay? But I think the, the, if we encourage more of the um, baby boomers, because first of all, they retire, Women are living, people are living longer. So what are they gonna do from 60 to 80 to 90? And you'll see a lot of the seniors, if you're out there in the grassroots, they're the ones who are out there. Voter registration, going to all the democratic clubs, getting involved. So, so we Grace, need, I, so I was so I have a question for you then. Yeah. When are you gonna run for office? <laughs> no, I'm in the democratic party. I well, want to do that and I'm, you I'm can embracing run. more women. But what I'm just saying is if we can include that conversation, and, and, and I was so amazed remembering the convention, this woman who ran for school board at 70, how old was she? Yes. And because she was encouraged, the hug of Obama. And she did run and making a difference in her school board. So that's just one thing I wanted to throw to To everybody. point out, yeah. I mean, do you guys want to comment on that generation? I'll just say that Emerge has had um, people of all ages in our program up through 72. So if you are, a baby boomer and interested in running for office, you should certainly apply to the program. And I'll just add, it, yeah. that's just an example, though, I think of the importance of having diverse voices at the table, though, because you have people who have a perspective that other people, they're just not thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so it is important for you, know, for you and people of your generation to know that you should be in positions of leadership. And, you, and it's great that you're involved in the Democratic Party because you're in a position of leadership and influence to be able to say to another woman, mm -hmm. you're going to run and we're going to help you win. Right. You know, we're going to help connect the people together. Mm -hmm. We're going to help harness the power of your network so that you will win. You know, so thank you for your service in the community and do consider running. The <laughs> Grace, I'm going to I'm going to bug you about running. Okay. <laughs> Yes, we have one more question. Hi, yes, my name is Elizabeth Burks. I'm a political organizer with SEIU, United Service Workers West. Hello, everybody, Hello. good evening. Um, yes, so my question is basically to everybody in the room. We represent janitors, and right now we have a campaign, AB 1978, which addresses uh, rape and sexual assault and harassment in the workplace. And so my question is, in talking, Ms. Hines, segue to what you just said, in, in thinking about um, expanding and expounding on the networks that we currently have, how can we make sure to uplift our most vulnerable, which are immigrant women, which currently are not a protected class, how can we uplift them to make sure that we rally everyone to ensure that we get the elected officials to pass the bills and whatnot? Carrie Ann, you want to take that? Since well, she I think by, um, by having these conversations, you know, by being in the room, you're an organizer and you're here mm -hmm. and you are now connected to us yes. and we are connected to women who we are supporting and running for office. And so one of the things that Jackie was talking about, we do, we make connections. Women bring people together. Women collaborate. So, you know, we now know one another and I know that's what you're working on and mm -hmm. I will, you know, be, you'll call me up and I'll say, yeah, you know, we should call so-and-so and we should make sure that, you know, their office knows that you're working on this issue and talk to you about it and become educated about it. Again, I think it's important to bring the different perspectives in and, and you bring in, you are opening the door for this, this underserved community to be able to share their voice and their perspective. Yeah, um, I, I just want to add to that. I mean, I, I even look to example, for example, what uh, Councilwoman Martinez has done on the issue of uh, of uh, human trafficking. Mm, um, you know, right. there there are issues that have been raised to the degree of actually being transformative under her leadership, uh, because again, we had a woman at the table being part of that conversation. Absolutely. And when you talk about issues like this. Um, you know, we have one woman on the city council right now, hopefully to change that very soon. Yes. But <laughs> the reality is, is that one of the things that we can do is just even through our own networks to help provide that accessibility to help connect to the right position, you know, the right leaders so that we can actually facilitate that change. 
and collectively apply that power so that we can have our voices heard for those women. We're all still women. Regardless Absolutely. of what our status is, we're all women mm -hmm. and we're all in this together. Right. And so I think it's very important for us to, to collaborate in that way to help facilitate those changes in the policy or shine a light on the areas that are not being addressed. And it, and it fits with, I, I just became chair of the LA Homeless Service Authority. The mayor appointed me to the commission and now just became chair two weeks ago. Um, and the <coughs> largest, uh, the growing population, the largest growth, homeless women. Mm -hmm. Um, and when you think about it, it's related to to some of the mm -hmm. you know domestic violence and, and all those other things that that occur uh, but we don't see that on the front pages of the paper no. um, and we're gonna try and change that so stay tuned um, to, to see that there is a growing challenge um, with more women which means there's more violence against women particularly yeah. in Skid Row and other places mm -hmm. so. Well, I would just like to say we are having a screening tomorrow with the uh, and Miss Rodriguez will be there. We are having a screening tomorrow with the mayor's wife, Miss uh, Miss Wakeland, and uh, it'll be right here, 5:30 p.m. And we have flyers at the table, so if anybody's interested, it's uh, Rape on the Night Shift. It's a PBS Frontline documentary about immigrant women janitors getting raped. So we'd love to have you all there, just so we can expand the network if anyone's available. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Our oh, okay. Or Irene after that. Hi, we'll, Barbara Steelman. We'll just take Steelman. these last two uh, questions and then I think we need to sort of wrap it up. Hi, I'm Barbara Steelman. I actually work for the city in the controller's office. Used to work for Wendy. And um, I have a question. I found out that a colleague of mine had actually submitted a referral on me to emerge and I haven't even applied and hadn't even really gotten to that point, although we I talked, remember Courtney. telling yes. Yes. So my question is, and it's a little bit touchier, I think, when you're staff in the role that I play, but for Wendy and for Monica, you've had positions, and then you've run for an other positions. So how do you handle that as far as both you know, your time commitments, your, um, I don't know, your, the perceptions or the challenges? If you could address that, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. I'll be just uh, briefly. I mean, I think, um, yes, it's a, it's a bigger deal, I think, sometimes, again, with, with women. And for me, it was uh, being a mom, ultimately, after I ran that first time. Uh, but women do things smarter and better, um, just saying. And, and so, you know, you can, I could do more in a day than most of the men, you know, when they'd say whether or not I could be a good mom and a good elected official, I'd say, well, I'm gonna work, you know, these times I'll go home, I'll take care of my kid, then I'll work afterwards. And so um, it's a commitment. I think the one thing about running for office that you know is there is a, a beginning and an end. Um, and so you can kind of say, all right, and in a special election, which is some people hate, I, I, I liked it because it was, oh, okay, it's only this period of time because I do not, I would say campaigning is not my favorite thing to do. I like governing, but campaigning was not my favorite thing to do. But you do it and you know, you know, you know where that time is and to be able to plan and, and say, okay, I'm not going to be able to do these other nonprofit or other things during this time I'm running for office. Here's where I'm committed to do. And you do have to give it your all. It has to be what you eat and breathe every single day. Um, but there is a beginning and an end. Yeah, uh, for, for me, I mean, I had to give up my position on the Board of Public Works in order to run. And that's a big decision, um, but it was one that I was willing to make. Uh, today I've been up since 3 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, it's, you, you live and breathe these things because it is important to you. And what fuels me, and I was sharing this with, uh, with someone earlier, what fuels me is the incredible amount of messages of support that I receive. Uh, and the, the, it sustains me. I'm actually you know, amazed at how much energy I continue to have in this process just because of the show of support that I have from the community, people that have known me, people that are helping me gonna, you know, get there. Um, but yeah, there are decisions that we have to make in terms of our, our sacrifices professionally um, and lining up alternative means of employment on the interim basis to help ensure that I can still provide for my family because I have an obligation. Um, and so uh, other people, when they're sponsored, they don't have to worry about that. Uh, they get jobs lined up for them or provided financial opportunities that will sustain them while they run for office. Um, you know, it's just, it's different for women. It's just those, those are some of the things that we don't have the most access to. Uh, that I think that through our networks we can continue to change and build upon. Um, I'm fortunate that I was able to, to arrange that for myself, but it, it really is an impediment for a lot of women going forward. 
it's one of the challenges that we have to overcome. If anybody thinks that this lifestyle that we chose as a career, a, a career that we've chose that turns into a lifestyle, unfortunately, is easy, it's mistaken. Uh, it takes an incredible amount of sacrifice and takes an incredible amount of sweat and tears that sometimes people don't see you cry and sometimes people don't see what we need to do to battle in our own homes to be able to just juggle uh, with the amount of pressure that it takes to serve is insurmountable. And we just need to be able to do more. Whether you're 60 years old, 70 years old, or you're 20 years old, we have to do a better job of being there for one another. And so the one thing I want to take away is we have to do more for our millennial girls. We just do. And I'm committed to do that. The other thing is we need to work on being really proud of who we are. I struggle every day with just feeling that I'm not prepared enough to be here. And I have to get over that as well. Because a lot of the people that I work with are not prepared. <laughs> and we have to own the fact that we are qualified and we have the confidence to be here because we have earned it. And I have to work on that. And so the things that I've been walking away from, um, you know, speaking to other women and putting these panels together is we have to give ourselves some a to-do list. I have a to-do list every single day. And part of my to-do list today is I've got to work on the younger women and teach them about our history. And then we have to own our power of being qualified and confident to lead. And we need to tell that to ourselves because so many times we just don't. And I'm one of those people that sometimes just doesn't feel like I was prepared enough or I, or I hit that ball out of the park. And you know, sometimes I don't and it's okay. Um, but I have to, we all have to build upon the fact that we have skills and that we earned our, our, our way here and um, we should be very proud of that. I want to thank our amazing partners that helped me put this together. First of all, my staff. And let's give our amazing panel another round of applause. Thank you very much, ladies, for being here.